Hello and welcome to Dielectric Videos. So on the last video, which I'll leave a link in the description, I did a full teardown, electrical analysis, and general testing of this 91 cent USB charger. Now once again, this was 91 cents with free shipping on eBay. It came straight from China in an e-packet, and it worked somewhat well. I would say it's certainly nowhere near the quality that I would expect from any reasonable, uh, reliable charger, but considering it was only 91 cents, the fact that it even worked and the fact that it actually worked well enough to charge a, an old flip phone suggested that it could potentially have some merit for use in a small application like an Arduino project, a nightlight, or some other low current 5 volt application. However, that's not exactly the intended application for this, now is it? This is meant to be a general purpose USB charger. So I'm setting out now to prove or disprove and potentially qualify somewhere in the middle. Is this a valid choice as your sole primary source of 5 volts for all your 5 volt devices? Now on first inspection, we determined that when you're supplying it with 120 volts, it can roughly output about 200 milliamps of current. When supplied with 240 volts, it can roughly supply 400 milliamps of current. Now, since this is quite apparently designed for the European market, it has a European plug on it, it can safely be assumed that if you wanted to really be fair to this device, you would run it at 240 volts. That gets it the most power, out or the most power output and current output and it really, even though it says it's full range, 100 to 240 volts, it's gonna do its best at, 400, uh, at 240 volts. We determined the reason for that is most likely to do with the feedback circuit, as well as the limitations to the primary side uh, winding thickness on this ferrite core transformer. So it's fairly evident that what we want is to run it at 240. Now to do that, I can do that fairly easily. I have my other bigger step-up converter, but I also have this small, uh, this is an auto transformer, non-isolating auto transformer that will also make a small amount of 240 volt supply. So we can easily make this happen, and this is not unrealistic to how you would operate this, especially if you were overseas in another country where they have 240 volts. Now the next question that's going to be most difficult is, uh, how exactly do I power big loads like a Kindle or a, a battery bank or my iPhone using such a small source? And on top of that, how do I make sure I'm not going to damage my iPhone or expensive, uh, other expensive USB devices should the negative feedback loop in this device fail? As you probably recall from the last video, this negative feedback loop involving a Zener diode is the only thing keeping the output from rising way above 5 volts. So with that in mind, what can we do to make this work? Well, I have here an Anchor 15600 milliamp hour power bank. Now this is a fairly nice power bank. It's got a decent front end on it. So if it did get damaged, it would be a little bit inconvenient. I would be able to replace the charging circuitry. And of course it wouldn't hurt the cells at all. But what this is going to do is effectively provide a buffer between the cheap charger and any device that I want to use. Now, in addition to assuring a greater level of safety for my loads, this is also going to serve as what would effectively be analogous to a water tank above a city. If, for example, you have a very small uh, well pump to supply your city, and on average it can supply enough water for the whole city, but maybe every once in a while, maybe it's during the Super Bowl and everyone goes at halftime and flushes their toilets, well, this uh, well pump would not be able to maintain pressure that's analogous to voltage at the output if everybody flushed their toilets at the same time. However, if you have a big water tank above your city, you can provide extremely large loads, much greater than the load of the water, that the supply of the water pump for short periods of time, provided that the overall quantity of water used never exceeds the capacity of this tank and it's given enough resting time to refill with the small pump. Now the second obstacle that I'll have to encounter is will this thing run reliably for the amount of time that's required to fully charge this tank? So when I connected this anchor power brick and measured it with the measuring apparatus, I determined that it auto negotiates to about uh, 330 milliamps. And we'll just call this a third of an amp. 
uh, just to make calculation easier down, down the road. Now at a third of an amp, this is a 15600 milliamp hour battery pack. And we're going to assume that just for the sake of charging, not for discharging, we can just round this up to 16,000 uh, milliamp hours just for the sake of assuming that it's going to be limited in how, uh, how, much, how efficient the charging process is. So this is not the amount of energy that the battery can actually provide to the load, rather this is how much energy it takes to charge up the battery. So now that we've established that, if we combine these two, we can determine that to fully charge this anchor pack from zero to full, it's going to take approximately 48 hours. So the question is, will this first off be able to supply its full rated current, or at least its full uh, load current, or close to it, for a full 48 hours without taking damage? Now the transistor did get quite hot in here, so I suspect it could be a real problem if this thing overheats. But uh, assuming that it does continue to operate and it doesn't burn up, also assuming the ferrite core transformer doesn't melt down, I think we're going to have no trouble getting this thing topped up within a reasonable amount of time. So once the anchor uh, brick is fully charged, why don't we start to calculate our energy budget for the, basically for each day on average. So one of the downsides of this anchor brick is it cannot receive a charge and uh, output a charge at the same time. So that means that we're going to have to take this off of the charger when we want to supply load to things like the iPhone, the Bluetooth speaker, the Kindle, other devices. So I've uh, done some quick calculation, and I'm going to assume that we're going to charge for 20 hours per day, and we're going to discharge for 4 hours per day. Now 4 hours per day is pretty generous, it gives plenty of time for the loads to fully charge up on this. And assuming that, if we really wanted to be super duper uh, squeeze every possible joule of energy out of this that we could get, I suppose we could get a, a second I could get a second power brick, a smaller one, probably just a single cell power brick, and I could then plug it onto charge when this one is not charging. And we'll get to that if it needs, if it's a requirement. But assuming 20 hours a day of charge time at one third of an amp, that means we get about 20 thirds amp hours, which is approximately 6.67 uh, amp hours. Now this is, on the surface, this is what it would appear our energy budget, or our charge budget, is per day. However, as I mentioned, uh, or as I probably haven't mentioned yet, but is quite important to note, this thing, this, char this battery, has an average cell voltage of 3.7 volts, but its output is 5 volts. So it has a boost converter converting this 3.7 volts to 5 volts at the expense of some, uh, of some charge. It means that every amp you get, you get out of this is going to draw slightly over an amp out of this input side. Now this boost converter is not perfectly efficient either. So just to make the numbers easier and make the efficiency calculation, uh, eliminate the need for the efficiency calculation, let's just be fairly conservative and let's round this down to just three volts. That 0.7 volts difference is gonna make up for the efficiency issues associated with the boost converter. So really, we're going from a three volt cell voltage up to five volts, and that is a three to five ratio. Now, if I'm guessing since this is an Anchor branded charger, it probably has a buck converter on the input side, so it probably fairly efficiently takes advantage of the full five volts going into the battery, five volts through a buck converter, into the 3.7 or whatever the cell voltage happens to be at the time. However, this is not the case for most chargers or most power bricks of this, of this sort. And I'm not entirely certain actually if this one does have a buck converter on the charger. Most of these have a linear power supply. And a linear power supply basically works by taking the 5 volts, running it through a resistor of sorts. This is usually a an active load, like a linear regulator, but you can think of it as just a resistor, and then putting it into the 3.7 volt battery voltage. So effectively, you're burning off that delta V between the five volts and the 3.7 volts, uh, basically wasting that energy. So what this means is every time you charge a battery, you're actually losing a considerable amount of the energy you're trying to put in 
So if we have too many layers of batteries from this to the load, we're losing a considerable amount of the energy. And since we have just one layer and we have this three to five ratio, assuming we have 20 thirds amp hours, oops, 20 third amp hours, and we're multiplying that by three fifths, we really, we can cancel the five and the 20 to get four and we can cancel the threes and we really only have an energy budget or a charge budget of four amp hours per day. Now that may not sound like that much, but let's do some quick math to see what can you actually get done with four amp hours per day. Now the biggest, by and large, the biggest load I'm going to have to use on this system is the iPhone. I use it all the time and I pretty much go through maybe a little bit less than half to three fourths of a battery charge per day. So for the iPhone, this is an iPhone 6S. It has a nominal battery capacity of, uh, let's see, 1715 milliamp hours. And we're subtracting that from our four amp hour budget, energy budget. And I've already done this calculation uh, on the side here. This leaves us with 2285 milliamp hours of battery charge left over for the day. Now you can see that's still quite a bit. I fully charged my iPhone and I still have more than half left over. So we'll move on to my next load, which is a Bluetooth speaker. And this Bluetooth speaker has roughly a 500 milliamp hour pack or cell in it. So now we're bringing it down another level to roughly 1785 milliamp hours remaining. That's still a decent budget. Now we're not going to be able to run the Kindle though, however. The Kindle has a 4400 milliamp hour battery in it and that of course doesn't align very well with this. However, I hardly ever use the Kindle. I actually haven't turned it on in a few months. I am going to try and get this Kindle on uh, fully charged from this system just to show that it can be done but I don't anticipate using it very often. If I did want to use it fairly often, if I only discharged it by about a quarter to a third of its charge each day, I could easily run it every day for that amount. Or if I want to get a full charge out of it, I could do that maybe once every four days. So if I want to read a book and read a full like three or four hour uh, discharge on this thing, I could do that maybe once a week and it would be, it would still meet my power budget. So. That's really, I don't think, it's not going to be a problem at all because really I'm barely using the Kindle. I'm only going to have to charge it up once at the beginning, so it's not going to be a huge problem on our energy budget. So basically we're left with the 1785 milliamp hours. Maybe we'll cut that in half or, or maybe let's just, we'll just round that down to 1000 milliamp hours left after uh, assuming the Kindle gets a little bit of use. And that's still quite a bit of energy as well. I have an iPod, which has like a 300 milliamp hour battery. And I have, I guess, a couple miscellaneous things. Sometimes I power a breadboard using a direct USB connection. So I might uh, assume a couple hundred milliamp hours here and there. But really, assuming that this thing doesn't stop working, I shouldn't have any problems meeting my entire USB energy demand for the day, assuming that I just keep this charging all the time. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if I wanted to be even more efficient, I could connect a second battery bank whenever this one's not in use. And uh, assuming that the final four hours per day is also used, uh, is also supplied, that's gonna get us four thirds of an amp hour or approximately 1.333 uh, amp hours. And that is yet another uh, of over a thousand milliamp, uh, milliamp hours left for further use. Now I don't anticipate having to do that. I think that just doing the anchor for 20 hours a day is going to more than supply, supply my uh, necessary quantity of energy, but that's not to say that I couldn't go even more and really milk every last milliamp hour out of this by using a second battery pack in the meantime. So really it looks like I'm going to have a fairly reasonable energy uh, supply from this. And I'll be able to, of course, get plenty out. This is a 4.8 amp maximum discharge pack. So I'm not gonna have any trouble with devices not getting enough current. And as long as I keep everything fairly reasonably duty cycled, and as long as I keep this charging 24 seven, I should basically have unlimited current for all my devices.
And we are back. It is 53 hours later and this anchor charger bank is fully charged up to 100%. So a quick update on what's, uh, what's transpired and what conditions I've had to face with this process. Surprisingly very smooth. The thing is the charger is still working, no problems there. And this, char this power bank charged up completely in just a few hours over the expected 48 hours. Now there's a pretty good reason for that, dis that discrepancy. It kicked off when it was about 75%. It, it shut off in the middle of the night and didn't start charging again. There was still voltage across this, but the charger decided to stop. Now I have a couple of theories as to why that's the case. I think one of the most likely possibilities is because it has a rather intelligent lithium ion charger in it, a lot of the uh, smarter chargers have a, in addition to the voltage detection, the constant current and constant voltage charging of the cells, a lot of them also have a timer feature. And if the cell charges for longer than the timer feature allows, it'll shut off the charging just as a safety measure to make sure there isn't some kind of a voltage read error on the battery voltage. But what I think may have happened was it may have run for so long because it was charging so slowly that maybe like 36 hours in or so, it just kicked off and turned itself off. All it required to fix was a manual unplug and plug back in, and it, it started right up again and it ran all the way to completion. But that of course explains the additional roughly five hours of missing time that it took to fully charge this. Now another problem that may be the cause for that, pro uh, that issue is a bit of a flaw with the feedback circuit, the voltage regulation circuit in this charger brick. As I mentioned, it's a, basically just a shunt negative feedback across the feedback winding, the auxiliary winding of the transformer. And if the transformer and the transistor get very hot, the accuracy of that feedback drifts off. And what you find is, if you've been running it at basically full capacity for a few hours, as soon as you unplug the load, the voltage rises up to about 5.9 volts. And I'm guessing this is because the beta value of the transistor, that is the relative current gain of the transistor, for, for a bipolar junction transistor, is in, it increases with temperature. So what I'm suspecting is going on is when this thing gets super hot, it's more difficult for the negative feedback path to pull down the output voltage because the transistor has a greater tendency to, to kick on and run. And as a result, the output voltage gradually rises. Now I wouldn't necessarily consider 5.9 volts to be dangerous to the devices plugged in in terms of possible damage, but what does happen is this charger with a fairly intelligent internal charger circuit, this power bank will not charge, it will not start if the voltage is above about 5.8 volts. Obviously that's to protect the circuitry inside of it, but when that happens you actually have to manually unplug and plug this back in from the wall to get the voltage to sag down enough for this to actually kick on its charging. As you can see, I do have a second power bank connected. Now, since I meant, as I mentioned, this power bank can only charge or discharge. It can't do both at the same time. So when my phone is charging, as it is right now, I'll mention that in a second, I have to also make sure that I'm still harnessing as much energy as I can from the charger. So I have this smaller power bank currently being charged by it, basically just maximizing my uh, utility of the device. Now the last thing I wanted to say is I have indeed connected my phone to the anchor. That's what this wire is now. And I ran my phone all the way down to zero volts. And then I plugged this in and uh, I'm in the process of charging my phone right now. So it's quite exciting. This, this section of video that you're watching right now was filmed rec and recorded completely 100% with the energy from this charger brick. So the 91 cent eBay charger brick has made its first YouTube video. Now, of course, that's not directly through, it's not directly powering it. It's just the stored energy in this anchor uh, power bank. But I think it is quite impressive that it managed to charge this all the way up without failing because of the prolonged duty cycle. And hopefully it'll continue to operate as such. I'm going to spend the next couple of weeks, hopefully, if it doesn't break earlier than that, uh, using this method to operate all my devices. And I'll gradually start transitioning in other loads like a Bluetooth speaker iPod, possibly Kindle, additional battery banks like this one, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to get everything running on this within the next couple of weeks. So I'll report back if anything significant happens or if 
I end up succeeding on making this work for a long-term operation. So I'll see you in a minute. So it's been just over a week since I started this project where I was ch keeping all my devices charged using only this power, this power adapter. And as you can see, it's 5.40 p.m. on March 17th. And I was gonna actually originally stretch this out to a two week video because I figured it would take a long time to get all my devices charged. What with only having 300 milliamps at my disposal. But surprisingly, I have had no problem whatsoever keeping up with demand. I mean, within the first five days, I had all these devices charged to 100%. The Kindle, I got fully charged up. I've got my USB speaker charged. As you can see, the bright flashing uh, DJ light that's built into this thing is quite impressive. And I got the uh, small iPod charged as well. Now, I also got these three power banks fully charged. This is the one I carry with me most of the time. This one's just sort of a novelty. It, it goes around your wrist. It's kind of a flexible device. And this, of course, is my main bank. This is the one I use to charge all these other devices and the phone that I'm using to record this video. That way I can keep them isolated from the possible questionable voltage regulation of this uh, charger. Now, I actually had so much excess power, and this was even with using my phone considerably more often and more rigorously than I usually do, I had so much extra power that I was maybe only putting this big bank on to charge for like eight hours out of the day, and it would just sit there idle the whole rest of the time. So I actually, even uh, beyond all these devices I've charged, I also provided charge to my friends Dirk and Darwin in my signals and systems class, basically charging their phone, and, uh, charging Darwin's phone and Dirk's power, or power bank just like this one. And uh, beyond all that, I still managed to get it charged all the way up by the end of today. So as to whether or not I recommend this as a long-term use device, it has proven itself to be remarkably reliable. If you're interested in buying one of these, the model number, I'll see if I can get it to focus, is HR-518. I can't guarantee, of course, that any sellers on eBay are going to provide this same one or that any of the rest of them are gonna be as good as this one was. But considering I basically was doing chunks of 48 to 55 or so hours of continuous charging at first, and it still survived and didn't burn out, is very, very impressive for the level of quality that I was expecting for such a cheap apparatus. Now, like I said, I, I wouldn't recommend plugging any really expensive stuff directly into this. If you need to use it as a sort of emergency power source, it's good to have a, a power bank like this. It doesn't have to be a big one like this. In fact, I rarely ever drop this below like a 50% state of charge. So if you're a light or average user for your smartphone or whatever device you have, just a small single cell power bank like this might be more than sufficient. So if you need a quick source of power, this is definitely a good option. Now it does only produce 300 milliamps and if you plug it in at 120 volts, it produces even less than that. So one of the things I should probably mention is any modern computer USB port will provide at least 500 milliamps, if not more, if it's a high speed charging port. So if you have access to a computer, there would be no reason to buy this. It would just be better to plug your power bank or your apparatus, your phone or whatever directly into the computer to charge. But if you needed to go someplace where you only had access to mains power and you didn't have any sort of a car charger or laptop around, this would definitely be a at least semi-viable option. I think I would probably have redundancy because I still don't fully trust the reliability of it. I mean, it's just such a, the components are so small uh, and probably undersized for the application that I wouldn't trust its really long-term reliability. In fact, if you just drop it on the table, it just sounds cheap, but it did hold up and it did maintain performance for many, many hours of charging, which honestly, I've heard of genuine Apple chargers uh, burning out with continued overload for that long. So in many respects, this has surpassed any standard of expectation for even a decent charger in terms of reliability. So I guess on the pro side, it's reasonably reliable. It's extremely cheap and probably not a bad choice for a small project like I mentioned in an earlier video, Arduino or Nightlight or something like that. And even for bigger equipment like this, it's certainly not, uh, not unviable. I mean, it has its drawbacks. I think the biggest con, of course, would be that it's 
only a 300 milliamp charger, not a 500 like it says on it, and even greater than that, that it doesn't work at 120 volts as well. It will still provide you the five volts though. I mean, it is genuinely a full range charger. It just can't give you quite so much current at a higher, at a lower voltage input. The other con I think I would mention, it really doesn't matter so much for the average consumer, but if you are operating this around other sensitive equipment, it does not have any high frequency RF suppression or EMI suppression in it. So you could have issues with ambient EMI emissions from this where if you had a sensitive radio or something nearby, this could adversely affect it or interfere with it. But other than those drawbacks and maybe the slightly high output voltage over open circuit, it is a reasonable device. I mean, it, it performed exactly how I wanted it to. And I mean, for 91 cents, it really doesn't matter if it even works or not. Like it's be so far beyond my expectations already that if this thing even worked for a couple of days, it would probably be worth the 91 cents. So that was my review on this. I hope that you uh, learned something from the either the teardown video or the review video. And it really also kind of calls into question sort of what other low energy source uh, energy sources I could use for, for USB devices. For example, if this is a 300 milliamp charger and it can run most of my equipment with eight hours of charging a day, well then a 500 milliamp solar panel might not also, uh, might also be viable as a solution. So now that I've learned how little energy I can actually get away with for my USB devices, I may consider future projects where I try to design more uh, sophisticated alternative energy source uh, charging systems for my, all my USB equipment. I think that would be a cool project and it would kind of relate to sustainability, which is one of my interests as an electrical engineer. So anyway, thank you for watching this video and I will see you next time.